welcome. Hello, everybody. Welcome to uh, this webinar uh, live at five. This is NCO uh, beaming out to all our members out there. It's fantastic to see you all joining and coming to be with us today. We've got um, three amazing guests, not one, not two, but three incredible guests from the world of sport and performance coaching and being the best that you can be. So while everybody's um, coming in, I will start the introductions and we're going to start with uh here we go we're going to start with Noel. Noel would you like to introduce yourself to us? Hi everybody my name is Noel Thatcher and I'm a visually impaired Paralympian um so this picture here uh, was taken many years before most of you were born all of you were born probably um after the Atlanta Paralympics in 1996 where I won one two gold medals in the 5,000 and 10,000 metres, um, which was especially a um, proud moment for me because I ran both those races with a small crack in one of the bones in my left uh, leg. So I had a stress fracture, um, but uh, got there in the end. Amazing. And Noel's very famous. He's got his very own Wikipedia page because um, he has been an incredible athlete for so many years. He's been in the Olympic, the Paralympics in 84, 88, 92, 96, 2000 and 2004. And he's the proud winner of five gold medals and two and holds, well, do you still hold two world records, No. Sadly, no, I've still got some British records, but most of the world records have been, been broken, but I've definitely still got the medals. Amazing, fantastic. And what, what does it feel like to get Olympic gold? That's an incredible moment. I always see, I was, a, I'm a frustrated musician. So I, I wanted to play drums when I was younger. And in fact, when I was at school, all I wanted to do was play drums and running, running came along a bit later, but winning a gold medal in the Olympic stadium was very much my kind of, you know, Carnegie Hall moment. So being able to sort of perform at my best, you know, on the greatest sporting stage in the world in front of a crowd of, you know, roaring people was just and representing your country, having the you know the British flag on your chest, that's that's an incredibly proud moment. And um, yeah, you, you you remember those moments for, for your entire life. Amazing, fantastic. And this is you when you were little. This is this is me when I was very little. Check out the tie and the collar from the nineteen. That must be somewhere in early nineteen seventies, I imagine. And um, you might get a clue as to my sight impairment there because I don't think I was focusing very well on on the camera. But uh, yeah, I uh, I had a fun childhood. Lots of Lots of outdoorsy stuff. Um, apparently, according to my dad, when I was four, I climbed up a mountain in, in Wales when no one was looking and had to be rescued. So I kind of always had a bit of an adventurous side, I think. Fantastic. And tell us about this picture. This is probably my favourite sporting picture. And in fact, I didn't win this race. The, um, the, the runner who's kneeling down, down, a Polish runner called Waldemar Kikolski, he just beaten me in the 800 meters at the 1992 Paralympic Games. I won the 1500 there, but this race came after that. And it's just, for me, it's, it's a celebration of, of friendship. It's a celebration of, of each other's achievements. It's, it's all that's, that's great about sport. So, you know, when you're, when you're playing in the orchestra and that, you play that last note and everybody stands up and cheers, that's that feeling that I had, you know, at this moment, the photo was taken. Fantastic. Great. So we're going to spend the webinar looking at um, the, the kind of achievements that Noel has, has had in his life and also how he managed to achieve them and seeing how those achievements are transferable to music, basically, by using the expertise and wisdom of our other two guests, who, uh, first of all, first up is Sarah Upjohn, who is an injury prevention physiotherapist, who many of you will have worked um, with us at NCO. She's been with us for a long time now, and we love her, and she's brilliant. So um, introduce yourself, Sarah. Hello, everyone. It's really lovely to be here, and it's lovely to see you all. Um, obviously, um, I'm not the furry one, okay? I'm the one in the glasses. Um, the, the other one in that picture is Miranda, my cat, and she's getting quite infamous um, on NCO. He, she contributes probably as much as I do to NCO. So my job as a physiotherapist working with musicians is um, I do treat injured musicians, but I do an enormous amount about um, musicians' health and well-being, keeping you fit and well and um, if you're physically well, it contributes to you playing well. So that's that's really what my biggest interest is. So. And this is a great motto. 
This is an inspirational moment from Miranda. So we've got this um, sort of wooden structure in our garden and she literally scaled it from floor level. That's about, oh, a metre and a half high. Um, and she just landed on the top. She believed she could, so she did. Fantastic. And that's really handy for my two children as well. I want to inspire them to believe that they can and they'll go ahead and achieve. And there you are, there she's having a rest. Yeah, that's after the, uh, <laughs> when she got down. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So she very beautifully matches the duvet cover, I think. Perfect. Colour coordinated cat. Well, great to see you, both of you, Anne Miranda. I don't know if she'll make an actual live appearance in the webinar, but who knows? She's locked out the back door. All right, <laughs> not to bother us. Okay, so moving on to Tom, who many of you will have met as well on our courses. Um, introduce yourself, Tom. Hello, everyone. It's great to be back again. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, so, yeah, hopefully some of you should remember me. My name's Tom, um, and I'm a French horn player, as you can see, and teacher. Uh, but I also created the Healthy Musician Programme at the Royal Welsh College uh, Junior Department, and I, and I still run that to this day. Um, so, um, yeah, I've, growing up, and actually I've been with NCO for a few years now, quite, quite a long time, so I've met a lot of you in person. Um, and growing up, I, um, I went through various different football academies, um, and, uh, and it was at a time when sports psychology and um, and uh, physical conditioning was, was really taking off. Uh, so a lot of what I teach in my, in my wellbeing lessons are stolen from sport, shamelessly stolen from sport. Uh, so it's great to have Noel along with us today to tell us all about that. Um, and uh, yeah, because actually we as musicians are, are like athletes. We, we practice to perform uh, using our minds and our bodies. Uh, so we should always try to prioritise our, our, our mental and our physical health and well-being. Although it's pretty tough, you know, it's, it's always a work in progress. Um, and actually the great thing about these webinars is it, um, it encourages us to, to keep trying. And that's Punch, uh, the lovable Punch. Actually, the last time Punch was involved in NCO, I was doing my well-being video and he knocked the, knocked the music stand holding the iPad over and cracked the iPad screen completely, so I had to get that repaired. So he's um, he's not uh, not welcome on the live sessions, but sometimes <laughs> uh, in the pre-recorded stuff. So there he is. Amazing, fantastic. And Tom's been part of the um, a lot of the other webinars that we've done that are all on YouTube. So I just wanted to flag that, and also that we're going to be doing a webinar selfie just like this at the end of this session today. So if any of you want to go and get a prop or something fun or a hat or an, your instrument or anything you want to have your photo taken with, with us and the webinar selfie, then, then that'd be brilliant. Um, and just to remind you that on the website, the members website, there is a big wellbeing section with lots of resources there now that we've built up over the over lockdown and, and since. So, Warm up exercises, uh, Tom talking about swish patterns, Sarah talking about sitting well, how to release tensions when you're playing, the stretches and warm ups you should be doing, body scanning, how to deal with nerves, how to build on success, and how to deal with disappointment because we all have disappointment. So um, be sure to, to have a check out of all of those. They're very short little videos, really, really useful, really helpful um, if you've ever got five minutes spare. So let's uh, stop the screen share. And um, I would like to, first of all, I'm just so excited to have Noel with us today. I would like to ask him, what's, what's it really like to be an elite athlete? What, what, how do you train? How, how is your life? What's the life like? I have to say, to start with, I, I, I did, when I was really, really young, I just enjoyed running. And I think that's really, really, really important. And I, don't, I think without that enjoyment of of anything is it's it's probably really difficult to get to a to, to to a high level because you know you're going to need to do this every day and i and i just love running um in, in fact it was when i was when i was 17 i one of my friends persuaded me to enter an athletic championship which was the national championships the visually impaired and i subsequently won the 400 meters there um having gone off way too fast and sort of crawled over the line in this kind of haze of you know fatigue and 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 someone in the crowd came over to me and, and looked down at me and said, ah, you run like a wild animal, but I think I can do something with you. And this turned out to be a really important person in my life. His, uh, his name was John Anderson and he was a coach. And, and at that time he was coaching the world record holder for 5,000 meters. 
And he was the person who began to convince me that I actually could be really good. And then I started training with, with his group of athletes. And I suppose it's the same as sort of coming to NCO and starting to see players who are a little bit more advanced or, you know, you're watching YouTube clips of, I don't know, it had to be Chloe Chua or any, whoever it is, you know. And I was like, wow, I really want to be like, like these people. The thing that was really good for me was that those people were in the same training group. I wasn't looking at them on YouTube. So I saw how they trained, how they thought, how they approached training. They were really professional. They were really dedicated to what they did, but they were also having a really good time, you know? So when we weren't actually training and during the training session, no one talks and it's, you know, it's, it's really intense. But before and after, these are your friends, you know, and they become part of your, your wider family. So I think being an, an elite athlete takes a lot of work but it also takes, you know, it's about creating like an, an environment around you that actually makes the process of, of training and in the case of music, practicing fun as well as, you know, so you've, you've got to want to do it and you've got to enjoy doing it, I think. Fantastic. I'm going to launch a poll now for all of you out there um, because I, no one was mentioning how proud he felt winning gold medals and representing Great Britain and all those things. And I'm sure you guys have been really proud of performances that you've given as well in your lives. So here's the poll. Think of a performance that you gave that you were really proud of. Which of the following helped you to make that performance really excellent? And you can choose as many of these as you like. So I had prepared my music well, my mind and body felt calm, and also excited. I'd practiced performing and understood what it was going to feel like. Um, I had people watching and listening to me who I care about, my supporters, or if it was exam, they were outside rooting for me. Um, I was keen to do my best. I'd eaten well um, and was comfortable in my clothes. And um, there's something else at the end. So if there's if you're if you're ticking something else, why don't you put in the um, in the Q and A, uh, put put what that something else was. But I can see it's all jumping up. About 70 percent of people have voted now, and we're getting there. Does that do those kind of things ring true for sport, Noel? Would you say? Someone's going to need to read. So, oh, in terms of yeah, um, in terms of practicing, I think it's 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 really important. You know, the, it's the practice that gives you the confidence for the performance for me. So, you know, I'd be really worried if I hadn't done any training and I turned up at a race, um, which funny enough, I did on Friday, <coughs> having had a bit of illness and that wasn't fun. It's, it's much more enjoyable and you're much more confident if you've put the practice in. But I think all the other things are really important as well. Great, well, let's see, I can share the results now. Um, let's see, so. 58% um, said they it was because they prepared the music well. 53% said their mind and body felt calm. Again, 53% said they practiced um, uh, practiced performing and understood what it'd be like. Um, actually, the most the highest votes was I was keen to do my best. Isn't that nice? <laughs> um, and the others are all very high. Uh, which is great. And somebody put um, something else in the chat. Um, confidence, having confidence. That's a great, great answer as well. Thank you for sharing that. So yeah, all those things are, are really important, I think. And we'll, we'll talk about some more um, as, we, as we go on through the webinar. Fantastic. So um, let's <clears throat> tell us a little bit about your site, Noel, and um, how that's affected you um, in your sporting journey. So I, I was born with a condition, condition called optic atrophy, which um, means that the, the nerve to take the signals from the eye to the brain, the optic nerve, um, and the cells of the retina, which is the part of the eye that receives information, didn't develop when I was, um, when I was a baby. So that was due to a lack of oxygen um, to me at birth. Um, and I didn't really know what that meant for a while. And I kind of just got on with life. And my parents allowed me to do most things. But... After a while, it became really clear that I couldn't, I, I don't think it, it was either a white car and a dark carpet or a dark car and a white carpet. I couldn't tell the difference. So my mum and dad took me to hospital and the doctor said, you've got optic atrophy and there is no treatment and it will, so it will never get better um, and to try to just get on with it really. And so I went to a, a regular primary school. I uh, couldn't see the blackboard. In fact, they bought me this massive great desk with a, a tilting out lid that I had to carry from classroom to classroom. So I was about six or seven. I was like, 
and I was really no mates. No one wanted to be Neville's friend because you had to carry the desk. No, I'm joking. But it, it was, it was re- that was the only really sort of the only concession. But when I was 10, I went off to boarding school for the blind and visually impaired. And that's, that's where I, I discovered running. So in some senses, I mean, I, I'm really grateful to, to be partially sighted um, because of the amazing opportunities I've had. You know, I've competed in six Paralympic Games. I've worked in Japan. I'm talking to NCO, which is a frustrated musician. This is probably the most excited I've been for a long while. Um, so I'm, I'm really, really lucky. And also I've been, you know, part of, of these amazing Paralympic teams, these teams of incredible individuals. So those of you who've seen Paralympic athletes like Johnny Peacock, or Hannah Cockcroft, Kadena Cox will know how, how incredible these people I'm lucky enough to call teammates are. And, you know, it really has changed my view of the world and what's possible. And, uh, and, you know, we're all incredibly unique, but together as a team, we can do amazing things. Exactly the same as an orchestra, wouldn't you say, Tom? Yeah, and that's actually, that's the great thing, isn't it, about an orchestra, is that in each section, you've got a, you've got a principal player who is enabled to be a principal player by the section around them supporting. Uh, supporting them and actually so music and sport uh, are so similar in that respect so they're really um, amazing gifts to be able to to have aren't they uh, just listening to Noel talking about sport you know it, it is exactly the same with me with music really it's allowed me to do all the things that I've wanted to do uh, in life so yeah it's uh, very well, similar. interesting to think about the the Paralympians and how they're all experts in different disciplines in the same way that musicians are experts in different instruments aren't they and that, that, but you're all very much part of that same team, and even more so, I guess, in an orchestra that actually an orchestra can't exist without all those different um, different teammates being, you know, really at the top of their game. Yeah, and funnily enough, in Atlanta, when I had my stress fractures, I spent a lot of time with the judo players in the team um, because of the athletes would be at competitions and things, and um, I was having a lot of treatment from the physios and doctors, and um, the, you know, we we fed off each other's you know confidence and and support and there was a judo player called Simon Jackson who was winning won a gold medal there and I saw him win his gold medal and I wanted to win you know a gold medal and but more than that we were there for the downtimes as well and when we were a bit low we were a bit sad and a bit worried and a bit nervous you know your teammates are there to support you and and, and lift you up fantastic great oh my goodness there's another poll um so this is one where you have to guess everybody one of our amazing guests owns a seven piece pearl export drum kit in uh, wine red with with zildjian symbols who is it who owns it now it's racing up i can see at the moment <clears throat> well it's neck and neck between tom and sarah and noel is sneaking into the lead at the moment <laughs> but we'll see um nearly everybody's voted and I'm going to close the poll and let you know that the answer is everyone thinks it's Noel. Is that right, Noel? Oh, well done, everybody. Absolutely. That was the very best present um, that I ever had um, when I was a child. And I badgered my mum and dad to buy me this. So I really, really, really wanted to play drums. I, I played a little bit in the theatres around Coventry and in school runs. I actually studied a little bit in, in Los Angeles for a while as well. <laughs> um so and then it became a kind of like running and music and you know i had to make a choice and i'm still hopefully i made the right one <laughs> actually that, that's an interesting point because i know a lot of our young musicians will get to a point in their lives where they're offered music or sport <laughs> and it breaks my heart when one yeah. of them has to yeah. i mean obviously you've carried on with both and tom you've carried on with both and i've carried on with both and you know it just feels like they're just too important for one of them i mean maybe one has to lead and the other has to follow but equally they're so important aren't they sarah um i heard recently that one of the australian commonwealth games team swimmers is a pop star <laughs> wow. exciting he's actually a pop star and he's put his music career on hold he's got a massive music career and he started training again and he's got into properly the Australian swimming team and he's competing this summer Amazing. and I know um I know one of the Bayern Munich footballers plays the tuba as well so I mean it's <laughs> but it's uh, <laughs> the great thing about the great thing about music and sport is they work so well together as well you know a lot about I think what we're going to talk about today is is um how to how to do music healthily 
Um, and actually, a lot of that is not pra over practicing, not doing too much practice. And a great way of breaking it up is is actually sport because it's good for our it's good for our physical side, isn't it? And it's good for our mental side as well because it it burns off adrenaline um, and um, makes us feel calmer and more at ease. So um, so yeah, hand in hand. Definitely. Find a way to do both. <laughs> Oh my goodness, another poll. Um, one of our amazing guests has tap danced dressed as a Christmas tree. Who is it? Ah, oh, they're jumping all straight in. Who do you think that is, Tom? I'm giving it away now. Well, it might be me. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's Tom. Definitely Tom. I'm afraid no, Noel I'm... has got no votes. At the hey, I'm, <laughs> I'm devastated. Come on, guys, I can dance. <laughs> Oh, yes, he has. He's got one now. Oh, thank you. <laughs> there is but staying very quiet. <laughs> I'm, it's sort of almost neck and neck between Sarah and Tom, interestingly. Uh, but Sarah's just squeaked into the lead with 55%, Tom on 43%, and Noel just has one vote for, for tap dance <laughs> like a Christmas tree. So there's an ambition that yet to be fulfilled. Tell us about that, Sarah. Well, it's never too late for anyone else to have a go at this. I was working uh, in the NHS um, as a physiotherapist, and at Christmas it's quite common for there to be some Christmas entertainment put on by the staff for the staff and um, the physio department um, lord knows how we dreamt this one up one of them was learning how to tap dance she taught us a very very simple tap dance we all lined up there were six of us in a row um, and because it was Christmas um, we also came across the idea of dressing as Christmas trees to do it so we did I have performed on stage tap dancing dressed as a Christmas tree you might need to do that for us on a course or, or on a webinar at some point, Sarah. I might need to practice. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I can do a shuffle ball change with the best of them. <laughs> Good for you. Fantastic. Right. Let's just talk a little bit about um, different running distances, Noel, because obviously you races must be really quite different depending on on how far you've got to run um, and that's a little bit the same for musicians in terms of whether you're playing with other people or playing on your own or playing things that take really lots of stamina or things that are sort of slower burn so tell us a little bit about what that's like in sport and then we'll see what we can tease out about what that's like in music okay so i'm really lucky in the sense that i've represented great britain uh every distance from 100 meters to the marathon over the course of 20 years of my running career. So, you know, the, the, the 100 meters in, is incredibly intense. And I think that race is probably one in your mind more than in your body. So it's all about, you know, being able to focus and react really quickly. And then it's all da -da 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 -da, it's really intense. And, and then it's literally over before you even, you can barely remember you've done it. And then at the other end of the scale, there's the marathon where, you know, you have a lot of time to think about things. And actually, probably to run a really good marathon, you need to learn to switch off at some point because it's really hard to concentrate, you know, intensely but for two hours. And so at, at some point, you need to sort of be, you know, to maybe think, think about, you know, how your body is, how your breathing is, trying to control yourself, calm yourself down and then you know when something happens and someone makes a move and sort of you know increases the speed and runs off um and you see your medal running away then you've you've got to respond but i think the, the other you know event that i've represented great britain in which i i really love and i think this is it's very special as um is the relay so i've run several four times 400 meter relays where you're not on your own and this is very much about you know this even actually even just mentioning the word relay there's some weird re reaction i've got goosebumps just mentioning the word relay because it is such a special event it's, it's again really really intense you know it's very tactical you've got to think about things you've got to make sure you don't go off too hard if it's really easy to lose um you know, to, to lose places because, you know, you, your muscles have gone tight and you can't run fast. But doing that with your friends is, is, is spectacular. So pull out of that the musical <laughs> um, similarities that you, that you will. But I think there's, yeah, lots of, lots of excitement and, and, and sort of passion in the 100 metres. And then there's kind of like a mellow, more mellow kind of zen-like thing going on with a marathon. Talk to that, Sarah. I absolutely um, can see the similarities between what musicians do, because if you are on an orchestral course, 
and you have a big rehearsal, it can be a bit like a marathon. It's an endurance event, an orchestral course. It can be in very many ways like an endurance event. And so pacing yourself through it um, is, is really important. Um, whereas something like um, an exam or an audition is much more like a sprint. It's a, a, you know, a very quick piece. It's probably finished before you realize it started. And afterwards you can't quite remember how it went. And so there are real parallels there. What about you, Tom? Do you want to add anything? Well, I think I definitely started playing music for the relay. I think I wanted to be in the orchestra. I didn't particularly want to be out on my own on the front doing 100 metres. Um, but yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, orchestra is, is all about stamina and it's learning when to, uh, when to go for it and when to ease back because you can't go for it all the time if you're doing a Mahler symphony for an hour and something. Um, whereas with solo performances, obviously, you've got to go for it the whole way through, really. Um, and, and a lot of that is to do with how you warm up as well. So if you're warming up for a solo um, recital, you know, you need to warm up a lot to be at your peak from the very beginning. Whereas if you're warming up for an um, orchestral concert, you might not want to be at your peak from the very start because it's a long piece um, and there's quite a way to go. And actually, usually symphonies kind of start um, start pretty gently and then and then get going a bit but so yeah I love that an analogy of the different races you know the solo your solo recitals your 100 and your 200 meter race and yeah your chamber is your 400 and your 800 yeah. when you've got to have a plan you've got to stick to it and you've it. and you've got to have a bit of stamina as well and then your and then your um, orchestral concerts are your, are your marathons and your 1500 meters but uh, <laughs> The national courses at NCO are sort of like a marathon and a sprint at the same time, aren't they? Because there are moments where you've got to be, um, you know, you've got to pace yourself through that whole uh, nine days or whatever the national course is. Um, but then at the end, you've got to, you know, give the 100%. And uh, it's amazing, actually, what happens on those courses. And I don't know if this is the same in sport, is that actually, as everybody improves during the time together, the whole thing just kind of goes up a whole other level that you just think, it couldn't, that's sort of almost impossible. Is that something that happens in sport when you bring people together? Yeah, definitely. Before the, the Paralympic Games itself, so before we arrive at the, at the host city, we normally go into a preparation camp. So in Sydney, we went to the Gold Coast, um, which was amazing. Um, and as, as the days go by, you know, you, you gel as a team and you're feeding off each other's energy and the closer it gets, the more excited people are. We're always really careful, though, not to train too hard and not to leave it all in, the, in practice. That's, a, that's probably a, an important point there because, you know, you want to give your very best when it matters, matters most. But certainly, you know, coming together as a team and, and developing those relationships and, and support structures and, you know, working with the staff. And by the time we arrive, you know, in the host city, we are one Paralympics GB you know, team and uh, we're unstoppable. It's fantastic. Actually, whenever I'm talking about NCO to people that don't know it, I quite often refer to it as a little mini team GB for classical music. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. That's kind of what it feels like, is that actually somehow bringing remarkable people together mm. creates something even more remarkable Absolutely. just by virtue of them being together. We've got a little message in the chat, actually, for you, for, for you know, um, from uh, from someone who's selling who, who says that her dad was in a Paralympian swimmer when you were running. Oh, my goodness. His name, Dervis Connell Rapp. Dervish. Amazing. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. That's, that's how <laughs> it's a small world indeed. But please say hi to Dervish. Yeah. And I hope he's 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 doing well. But yeah. You know, this is the great thing about being involved in orchestra and involved in sport is that, you know, you do make make friends, you know, and these friendships last a lifetime. And, you know, that's it makes us richer as, as people, you know, enriches, enriches us even as, as people. Are. That's fantastic. Thank you so much. Yeah, that was people also say that about NCO that actually you make friends for life and a lot of people that have been through NCO way way back are still mm -hmm. friends with people that they were they were in NCO if anybody's got any questions they want to ask our amazing guests please do um put any any questions in the chat or in the question Q&A sorry not the chat the Q&A and we will ask our guests um Joshua said that which is a really nice comment that it's easier to sustain your efforts when you love what you're doing that's what you said at the beginning isn't it Noel that actually I loved running I always loved running and 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 you know that's the fire isn't it that keeps you going absolutely and the rest is a bonus really you know you love what love what you do that's the big message yeah yeah fantastic 
Great. So um, tell us a little bit about the difference between how you prepare and how you perform, if you like, no, in sports. So for us, it, we practice and then we do a concert. For you, you train and then you run a race. Um, how is it different, um, the, the, the training to the racing? There's a lot more of the training than there is of the performing. So you're, you know, in my case, you know, I might be training for, for four years. So you think about the Barcelona, you know, about 1500 meters. The race lasted three minutes and 56 seconds. And I put four, four years of work into that. So that, that's one big difference. But throughout the training, you know, you are, you're rehearsing, you know, you're, you're, you're building, that's, you know, you're building the foundations of the performance. So in my case, that could be running anything from, you know, 80 to 100 miles a week. So going out running twice a day. It could mean going to the gym and it could be mean, you know, doing other sort of exercises to support that so that on the day of the performance i'm you know physically prepared and there's an awful lot of, of mental rehearsal that goes into that as well so that can be simply simply as just sorry as, as simple as just imagining myself crossing the line first so i did a lot of that you know um and and that's the sort of image that you're you, you have in your head when you're down at the track and it's pouring down rain in february those are the sort of things that that carry you through but there's a huge number of people involved in, in a performance as well so there's a lot of lot, lot of people when i'm on the start line i'm obviously on my own or you know in some cases with a guide runner for me but you know we have coaches we have physiotherapists we have strength and conditioning coaches we have dietitians we have a whole group of people who and our families and our friends of course you know who enable us to be in the very best position when it, it's time you know to give of our best so when the gun goes off or i don't know the conductor comes on stage or whatever the analogy is you know you are you're absolutely ready to give your very best performance so who would you have had around you just give us some ideas of the people you, you said your family you said your physio what your coach is there anybody else that would have been supporting you so yeah so if we think so family and friends, hugely, hugely, hugely important uh, uh, coach, physiotherapist, sports psychologist. We have people to support us uh, from nutritional point of view. Um, so people make sure that we're eating the right foods to put to, to, so that we're physically and, and mentally ready. And some people forget that a diet has a really important role in how you function mentally. So, you know, if you eat really, really well, you can feel really alert, ready to go. And if you eat really, really badly, sometimes you feel a bit sluggish. You know, that, that can support your performance as well. Um, from the medical team, to whom I owe an awful lot of my gold medals um, because I've been injured a lot, you know, with doctors and nurses and, 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 a, and a whole group of other people and volunteers. And, you know, maybe also, you know, the, the unsung heroes, the volunteers at the games that we go to, who build the atmosphere and and the emotional background to our performances so that might be people in, 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 in the venue itself and the people around so the community but there's a lot of people that that get you ready to do your best how does that translate to music sarah would you say your experience um i think that musicians in the future will benefit from more of a team supporting them behind the scenes and I think um, for a lot of musicians now they're very much on their own in terms of preparation and team support. Um, there are pockets where it's getting better but musicians you know, will be at peak performance when they've got psychological support about performance, when they're nutritionally optimized when they're really really eating well and when they're well hydrated when they're physically at their fittest that makes a big difference to how well you can play um, and when their technique is good and so the parallels with what will make you know the the ultimate musician are really the same as what will make you know a really superb elite athlete and I think dancers are getting better at it soccer players are definitely on all of that um, and musicians are catching up but well, not we're, hoping quite there. we're putting some of that stuff in place at NCO and exactly. we're hoping that that people can go uh, go away and think about how they might create those support networks for themselves um, because they are all really important components and if you ever feel like you're on your own you don't need to be because there's you know just reach out there we can certainly point you in the right direction there are other people that can point you in other directions and there's so much help and support out there so do you want to talk a little bit about that Tom? 
Yeah, I was just going to say, of course, we've got technology on our side as well now. So a lot of a lot of what we do, we can record and an analyse afterwards and analyse with our teachers as well. I try and get my students to record as much as possible um, because then they can send me stuff and it doesn't have to be done in a, in a lesson as well. So technology is on our side and we can use the Internet and we have webinars like this and things on YouTube. So try and, and try and use them as much as possible. Um, and of course, NCO, you've got myself and Sarah and, and various other brilliant people um, we're begging for you to come up and ask us questions about, you know, what techniques you can use, mental techniques you can use and, and, and what little exercises you can do to get better, your, better at your instrument. So, so do ask. I think us musicians, unlike the sportsmen and women, probably have to go out finding those, those um, answers a bit more. Um, but you guys have got it as good as any other, well, better than any other generation of musicians have, have had it. So um, make the most of it. And I, I think it's really, really interesting. I think how bodies work is so interesting. It's not just about how your instrument works, it's how your body works. So in order to make the instrument work, that is endlessly fascinating. We've all got a body. It's really cool. Fantastic. Oh my goodness, another poll. Okay, this is about embarrassing moments. I know you all like to ask about embarrassing moments. So this is about Noel's most embarrassing athletic moment. So first up is getting locked in a toilet 10 minutes before the World Championships 10,000 metres final. Uh, the second one is facing the wrong way when the gun went off at the start of the Paralympics 800 metres final. And the third one is having to stop in the 10,000 metres in Sydney um, to fasten a shoelace that had come undone. Okay, so these are <coughs> climbing up and they're sort of neck and neck at the moment. So it's going to be really interesting to find out which one of these, which, Tom, which one do you think is true of these? I love the idea of you facing the wrong way. I think that would be the <laughs> ultimate embarrassment, but I'm not sure. I don't know. I don't think that could possibly be true. <laughs> <laughs> and what about I, you, Sarah? I, I, love, I love the idea of being locked in a toilet because haven't we all been nervous about that? <laughs> <laughs> okay. I think pretty much everyone's voted, so I'm going to end the poll and share the results. And you'll be able to tell us whether this is right, Noel. People think, most people think that you got did get locked in the toilet. Then sec, coming in second is having to tie your shoelace and third is facing the wrong way. So uh, do you want to talk us through this? Well, folks, um, two out of three are actually true. So yes, I did get locked in the toilet um, and had to be rescued. 10 minutes before the um, World Championship 10,000 metre final in Madrid. And I was properly panicking at this point. Right? Um, and yeah, our coach let, uh, was making fun of me for a long while after that. My plaintive, help, help, from this tiny little window as I was standing on the toilet, peering out. Um, and in my defence, Tom, when, when I was facing the wrong way when the gun went off, the announcements, I believe, were in Korean. OK, <laughs> even then I should recognise on your mark, set, go, right, at this point in my athletic career. Um, so, so no shoelaces have come undone and I wouldn't stop. As soon as the gun goes off, the only time I'm stopping is when I get across the line. So does on your mark, get set, goes, is it said in all different languages? Well, it probably not, but it may be at that point in my life. It may have been English um, in, all, in all honesty, Kathy, but uh, uh, how was I, in, how old was I? In I was 22 and that's my, the most nervous I've ever been in my entire life. I was literally shaking as I went out onto the track because just before I went on, two of my British teammates had won gold medals in the other sort of sections of the 800 metres. So it was mine to lose, as it were. And... Um, yeah, I, I probably was just in an entirely wrong headspace. So I could have done with Tom there, calming me down and giving me some, some techniques, maybe some, you know, centering techniques and some <laughs> psychological support to get me through that. Next time. Yeah, please, please. <laughs> hey, Sarah. Can I just wonder if instead of marks, set, go, could they not just go two, three, four? Oh, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Just yeah. a thought. <laughs> and we need to know we need to know the temp tempo. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> BPM. Let's go. Yeah. And uh, we've got a question for you, Noel, from Henry Porter saying, um, is that a Guinness World Record on the wall behind you? Uh, good spot. Was it Henry? 
yeah, yeah. so good spot this was actually in 2011 or 2012 so there's a team of um, staff and a couple of students from a, a school in North London uh, called Forest School and we ran on a treadmill um, for 24 hours in, in um, what's the word in relay formation yeah um, and we beat a team of, uh, we beat the record which had been held by a German team. I think we ran about 475 kilometers. So we were running at 18.2 kilometers an hour throughout the night. And that was something else. <laughs> that, was, that was something else. That was one of the most difficult things I've ever done, but it was also loads of fun because everybody was out on the school field as, as, as the sun came up in the morning and cheering us on. So that was pretty special. Wow, good spot. Thanks, Henry. Um, now we've got another poll about Tom because we love Tom and we want to find out more about him. So this is a true or false poll. Tom used to pay, play football for Plymouth Argyle Junior Academy and nearly became a professional footballer. Is that true or false? Tom is an excellent golfer and has played at Glen Eagles. Is that true? Tom was Cornwall County Junior Tennis Champion in 2006 or Tom is a competitive windsurfer specialising in freestyle jumping. Ooh. Okay. So we have to see which of these um, people think is true or false and loads of people are voting, which is brilliant. Quickly while they're voting, um, we've got a question for you, Noel. What, when, when was the first race that you ran for Team GB? How old were you then? I was 17. So just after I won the national 400 meter title, I got selected to go out and run uh, European championships in, uh, in Bulgaria. So I was still at school. Wow. And, and another question, what's been your favourite performance of your life? Your, you know, your favourite race or your favourite moment? Ooh, I think that's going to be either the 1500 metres in Barcelona because the crowd were absolutely incredible in, in Spain. They were so passionate. And that was probably the first time that as Paralympians, we kind of felt like, you know, we, we belonged and they'd taken us to heart. So that was a very special moment. And then the other one is uh, the Sydney 5000 metres in um in 2000 where I kind of I blew the 10,000 three days before I didn't really concentrate managed to scrape a bronze and it got told off by my wife who, my, now my, um, and said I should actually you know focus a little bit um, that's not what she said exactly but anyway um, and in the 5,000 I, I went to the front as soon as the gun went off and then I, I won that gold medal in a new world record and the really special thing is that my wife and my teammates were down trackside to see me over the line and again that's one of those goosebump moments so that, that's really special amazing oh such happy happy tales right the poll is in um 83 <laughs> percent think you played for plymouth argyle um, most people think you're not a good golfer and didn't play at glen eagles um people did think 53 percent did think you you probably were cornwall junior tennis champion and I'm afraid 53% um, people don't think that you're a competitive freestyle windsurf jumper. So do you want to tell us what the answer is, Tom? Well, I sort of, I do windsurf, but it's more sort of freestyle falling off, if I'm honest. Like, it's terrible <laughs> windsurf. I do try. I'm a trier on the windsurf board. Uh, but no, it's the football. Football was my uh, first love growing up. Uh, but I, I wasn't quite as good as Cristiano Ronaldo, so um, I settled for music instead. <laughs> <laughs> amazing fantastic and we're running out of time we technically only got one more minute which is really sad um but just to perhaps to close um what advice um were you given when you were young that you you thought was really valuable or if you were looking back on yourself when you were 12 years old what advice would you give yourself Sarah what would you say to yourself or to somebody who's 12 I would say be kind and do stuff do stuff tell us more about do stuff well I think we spend a lot of time waiting for a good opportunity to do something and I think it's really really a good uh, way of approaching stuff to just don't hold back just have a go if an opportunity comes your way try something it rarely goes wrong and if it does go wrong it's usually you learn something from it anyway. So, you know, look for every opportunity going. Um, just try stuff. Be kind to people and do lots of things. That's great, because I think quite often people just think I'm, I'm waiting for this thing to happen. Yeah, and actually, or, or, you, or they you can make put it themselves 
put themselves in a box. I'm a musician. I'm not an athlete. Mm. You can do more than one thing. Great. Sarah, what would you say, Noel? To myself, probably worry less and enjoy the moment, you know, because again, sometimes you can put yourself under pressure. You've got exams coming up or, you know, you're rehearsing for something, but actually try and enjoy what you're doing on that, that day. Because honestly, I always competed best when I was happiest. Um, and, and, and that comes again, you know, be kind to yourself, enjoy what you're doing, love what you're doing. Fantastic. And Tom, that kind of rings true for you, I imagine. Yeah, definitely. Those are two really good ones, actually. Um, but uh, I, heard a, I heard a good one the other day, which was uh, don't compare what you feel like on the inside to what everyone looks like on the outside, uh, which I think is absolutely uh, right for this day and age, because everyone puts up pictures of everything they're doing and it's all happy and joyful. But um, it might not be that all the time. So don't don't worry about what's going on with other people and just um you know, be kind to yourself, like Sarah and Noel just said, really, and enjoy it. Yeah, fantastic. Right, I'm just going to quickly whiz through a little screen share to show you what's coming up um, before we go. So uh, the few things to put in your calendar, if they're not already in the calendar, I'm sure all of you who are going to be at the Projects Weekend this weekend, we can't wait to see you. All the instruments are going <coughs> flying around the country at the moment to be ready for you, to be set up um, so that we can have a fantastic weekend of uh, toe tapping and finger clicking and amazing music making. And we can't wait to see you. Um, we've got mega socials coming up for our national members um, all across June in the different orchestras. So make sure to join if you're part of one of our national members. On the 7th of July, we are super lucky to be joined by Ayana Witter Johnson, who's an amazing cellist who actually took your advice, Sarah, and kind of found her own route, really, and has created a sort of her own kind of style, her own identity, very much in music. And I think it's a real inspiration to us all that actually there's not one way to be a musician. There's there's so, so many ways that you can be. So um, I'll be talking to her on the 7th of July. Then we've got sectionals coming up for the national orchestras um, through in July and auditions are now open for next year. Um, it's all on the website. I don't want to go into too much of it now. But of course, we would love you all to re-audition and come back and be part of NCO next year. Um, we are hosting a webinar on the 19th of June at five o'clock. If you've got any questions about how to audition or any queries or anything you want to share, um, we can we can hopefully answer all your questions and tell you um, all the pros and cons as, lo as long as along with all the other people who perhaps haven't been members of NCO yet um, who will want to audition as well. Um, also, just to quickly flag that we have so much on YouTube, so if you ever want to just have a little moment um, on YouTube, there are so many different, we've got another webinar very much like this with very different people, but the same topic, um, again Tom was in there, but Claire Bennett, who was uh, actually a, a, an Olympian uh, fencer. Uh, who joined us then, and Anne Denham, who's, who is a harpist, the harpist for the Prince of Wales, joined us on that one. So if you, can't, if you haven't got enough of this, how to be the best you can be, there's a whole other webinar about it, which is also brilliant. Then we've got all sorts of amazing guests as well on our YouTube. So um, there's, you know, Sheku, there's guests from the Royal Opera House, there's Tams and Greg and Bill Bailey. That's a real cracker. If you haven't seen it yet, it's a really good one. Then some of the guests that we've been working with this time, uh, Sarah Willis and Jonathan Kelly, who are both in the Berlin Philharmonic, you know, possibly one of the greatest orchestras in the world, telling us about what it's like to work there. Jess Gillam on what she loves about being a musician. So for conductors, why do we watch them? What's the point? <laughs> um, so a few top tips about what you're looking for in a conductor. So they're all out there, all these webinars, and this one will be too, um, for you to catch up on if you want to see it again. <laughs> Um, so thank you all so much for joining us, all our NCO children, and a huge thank you to Sarah and Tom, part of the NCO team, and a special, special thank you, Noel, um, for joining us today, because it's such a treat to talk to somebody who's had your life experience and um, achieved all the amazing things that you've achieved. You're really uh, a lesson to us and a kind of, you know, icon, really. So thank you so much for sharing everything with us today. It's been it's been a real pleasure and a real honour for me, and I'm so excited to be able to be involved with with NCO because you know these 
every single musician amongst you. You're just amazing people. You've inspired me. I've been I was really lucky to be at London Yellow sharing and I've seen the videos of the other sharings and each and every one of you is, is incredible. So please, please, please just keep being yourself and doing what you're doing. I absolutely love it. Thank you. Great. Well, we've got to do quickly do the webinar selfie before we go. So if you've got anything to um to share. <laughs> Sarah's got a, what's that? No way. Right. No way. Am I allowed to use this? Yeah. Yes. Yo, oh, yes. wow. Yes. A whole gold medal. <laughs> we got a, bling, a bling, bit of bling. I'll get my race for life medals, shall I? <laughs> <laughs> I'll get my Hatfield Product Fun Run medal as well here. Next. Okay. Um, we can't, could you just bring the gold medal in a bit? Um, hey, into the middle, A bit up. That's it there. Bang on. Fantastic. Okay. Here we go. Three, two, one. Let's see your selfies. Fantastic. We've never had a gold medal on a selfie. Oh, there before. you go. That's an NCO first. Great. Thank you so much for joining us. It's been a complete treat and a pleasure. We look forward to seeing all your all your webinar selfies. Uh, make sure you send them in to us, put them on the Dropbox link that's on the website. Um, and then we'll put them up in the gallery and we might share some of them on our socials. So we can't wait to see you. Um, loads of you on, on the weekend and many more of you on all the other activities. So uh, thank you from me. Huge thank you to our amazing guests and we'll see you all very soon. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.